So, uh, so uh, thanks, uh, Christian, for the very nice talk, and thanks, Daniel, for the nice introduction. Um, we are now going to talk about uh, this paper uh, in collaboration with uh, Markus Heinrich from Arik uh, University in Dusseldorf, Ingo Roth from the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi, and Martin Klisch from the Hamburg University of Technology. So as a quick uh, outline and summary, uh, as we just saw, um, for the classical, uh, for the outcome of the classical uh, uh, shadow estimation protocol, we can um, see this as a, a measurement channel applied on our input state row. And this channel is um, very important for us because it allows the uh, classical post-processing of the uh, snapshots that we uh, get quantumly. And uh, the, this uh, classical shadows uh, constructed this way are then used to uh, constructing the, uh, the estimator of uh, the expectation values we are interested in. In the second part, uh, we will consider uh, a brickwork circuit, but uh, this time we will uh, uh, restrict ourselves to only two uh, layers. And as before, uh, they are made up of two local unitary gates where uh, each brick uh, is drawn uh, from the Clifford group in practice or more in general from a unitary to design. In particular, we are interested in the characterization of the measurement channel associated uh, to uh, this uh, ensemble, uh, knowing that uh, uh, it is diagonal in the Pauli basis. We will in particular see that given this uh, representation in terms of distance on network that is uh, meant to be as uh, two copies of this circuit here in the picture, uh, we can uh, evaluate exactly and efficiently the uh, diagonal elements of this channel. And finally, we will also quickly compare the brickwork shadows with the local Clifford ensemble, at least in the case of Pauli observables. So, as a very first step, we need to introduce some notation concerning the uh, brickwork circuit. And uh, to, for this, it's meaningful to consider a very simple example. Uh, so we uh, let's consider, uh, let's say, the upper part of the tensor network uh, we uh, we are using, and let's consider a Pauli observable, where for convenience we are uh, grouping the single qubit Paulis according to the structure of the second layer of the circuit. Now, whenever we have a situation like this, where uh, we have two uh, identities corresponding to a brick, then the twirling uh, with this brick would be uh, trivial. So it's not really interesting. And indeed, what we are interested in are uh, these uh, blocks. Uh, and also, uh, if they are consecutive to each other, and we, uh, as in this uh, example here. And we call this, uh, these sequences as a connected component. Moreover, uh, the, the, the effect of this uh, pair of identities here uh, means that we, in practice, have to consider just an effective circuit, which is associated to the Pauli string we are considering. And uh, for instance, in this case, with this given Pauli, uh, the effective circuit is just the uh, product of two smaller subcircuits. Uh, and this circuit is actually characterized by two quantities that we introduce. The first one is a notion of support. Uh, which is just the set of bricks in the second layer, um, which are in the support of the Pauli string we are considering. And secondly, we, we need to uh, keep track of these connected components. And this is done by uh, this, uh, what we call partition of the circuit. Uh, actually, what we store uh, is a sequence of the, uh, let's say, this, uh, the length of the connected components. And here, well, we just have the values uh, associated to uh, the circuit we are considering. Uh, then we can move to our uh, main result, uh, which are uh, analytic expression uh, associated to such circuit. Uh, they are basically obtained by reducing the uh, tensor network to some systems of recurrence relations. And in particular, uh, we uh, obtain uh, this uh, expression where uh, each diagonal element of the measurement channel is basically determined by uh, the uh, structure of the partition uh, of the circuit associated, uh, where here in this case we have these two uh, function uh, sigma and psi, which can actually be evaluated exactly, and you can see the uh, uh, exact formulas in the bottom part. So uh, just to uh, give a, again a quick example, uh, first, of course, in the case where we have a fully supported circuit, this measurement channel is uh, formally easy, but in a case of a um, uh, an effective circuit that has this structure as the one we saw before, 
Well, uh, we have uh, two elements in the partition. That just means that the measurement channel can be evaluated by taking the product of two functions, where uh, in particular uh, we have the first factor is associated to a subcircuit. In this case, the subcircuit is acting on uh, the first four qubits, and uh, the same, uh, of course, applies for the second subcircuit. Um, now I want to very quickly give you the idea of the proof of this theorem. And the very first step is to consider, again, a distance or network. Uh, we just, uh, we, we are talking. And uh, what we do in this case is just consider the structure of each, uh, of each layer. In particular, we know that uh, each brick here uh, is a two design. So we, we, we can twirl the, uh, pa let's say, the Pauli string layer with the second layer. And actually, w we can also twirl the computational basis layer on the bottom of the picture with the first layer of the circuit. And when we do this, we arrive uh, to an expression of the uh, measurement channel like this up to dimensional factors, where uh, actually we know exactly w w what each brick is. And in particular, uh, the first layer of this uh, of this tensor network is made up of uh, projectors onto the symmetric subspace. Uh, while the second layer of the circuit uh, uh, is made up of operators that basically are non-trivial uh, whenever the corresponding brick in the original circuit was uh, in the support of the, poly uh, of the poly string we, we are considering. Uh, in particular, this second uh, uh, fact uh, implies that we obtain different values of the measurement channel according to the partition of the circuit we are considering. And lastly, what we can show is that uh, one can just uh, the, the proof reduced to the simplification of these two traces that can be done recursively, and uh, this recursion can be written in terms of uh, this uh, of some systems of recurrence relations, and then we can find analytic solutions for them. As a very last topic, I want to uh, compare the Brickware shadows with the local Clifford ensemble. And in particular, uh, I want to consider only Pauli observables in this case, uh, for which we know that the sample complexity, which is controlled by uh, the variance uh, of the estimator, is in this case upper bounded by inverse measurement channel. And in particular, in the case of, the, of, of a local Clifford ensemble, uh, this measurement channel is uh, controlled by the number of qubits in the support of the observable we are considering. And what we observed is that uh, is the following uh, threshold criterion here, uh, which tell us that we uh, have a um, sample complexity advantage using the brickwork shadows whenever the uh, total number of qubits in the support of the observable satisfy this condition. Uh, it's basically uh, like a threshold indeed. And here we have a, a simple plot in the... Yes, <laughs> I'm finished. Uh, um, this simple plot where we have the... Uh, uh, th this threshold evaluated uh, for a fully supported circuit for uh, up to 100 qubits. And I, won't, I can just conclude now and thank you for your attention. Thanks for the two nice talks. Do we have some questions from the audience? Yeah, there in the back. Maybe you can uh, give them the microphone, please. Maybe while you're getting the microphone, I can let Alvaro already ask. Hey, thanks for the talks. Um, maybe it's more for the first speaker, this one. So you mentioned that uh, you store the shadows as uh, matrix product states. So how do you actually obtain the tensors from the measurements? Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, I, I can just shout. I don't know. Yeah. So the the the. Here, well, for, for each single, I, I put this picture here, but obviously there, were, there wasn't much time to, to uh, absorb it. For, for each individual unitary, you can simply uh, contract the legs that are not cut by this line, and the legs that are cut by this line stay open. And so we get, for each layer, we add the bond dimension, well, we multiply the bond dimension by two, which gives a bond dimension which is exponential in the depth. But since the depth, we pick it to be logarithmic in the system size, the bond dimension will stay polynomial. Is, was this your question? Or? Uh, the, this, um, well, yes, but uh, these unitaries are the unitaries that we actually pick, and the measurement data will be a computational basis state. 
right? Uh, like this. And then uh, finding this is just a matter of contracting the first leg with the, these bits. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, the, the question is more uh, general about the method of using tensor networks to estimate the, the frame operator. Uh, so there are two assumptions there, which uh, basically one is that your bond dimension won't explode at some point, and and that your frame is actually diagonal in the Pauli basis. So what happens when either or both of those things are not true? For example, if you have crosstalk in your system, you have long-range correlations, so the bond I would expect the bond dimension to explode it in that scenario, and also like accord due to noise, your frame might not be diagonal. So um, about the diagonality, uh, I think as long as it is Pauli noise, this should be okay, because uh, the diagonality of this, uh, of this measurement channel comes from the Pauli invariance of the ensemble. Uh, if it's not Pauli noise, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> this might effectively uh, ruin everything. I do not know. And about, uh, I'm not sure what, what, which bond dimension do you refer to when you are uh, talking about it exploding. Do you refer to the bond dimension? Uh, oh, if, if you're expressing the diagonal of the super operator as a tensor network. Okay, right, yes, here. And then, but then if you have, for example, some crosstalk in your system, mm -hmm. the crosstalk will, will create long range correlations. So when you try to simulate, so then, it, it, then the structure of locally applying tensors locally is is not true anymore. So right. Um, I do not consider noise. We do not consider noise in this. So, but but it is, a, it is an interesting question that I had not considered how the noise might affect the bond dimension of this. Um, I believe that as long, so this is this all works like locally on a basis of like. Uh, let's say, light cones of logarithmic size. So as long as the noise is contained in there, I think something can be made. But otherwise, uh, I honestly cannot answer because I have not uh, thought deeply about noise in this setting. OK, thank you. OK, I'm afraid that was all the time we had. So maybe you can uh, ask questions in the Discord channel or I guess also physically after the talk. But let's thank our two speakers again.